Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on axial members. We've addressed tension members, then modes of failure for simple compression members such as rolled sections and hollow sections. And now we're going to talk about uh, other means of increasing the breadth of columns. So we talked about uh, using tubular members as a first step. Uh, now we're going to talk about trust columns, which involves mutually braced compression members that are laced together with triangulating web members. The classic place we might see something like this is in a crane used to assemble buildings. So here we have the support structure for a crane with four vertical compression members. These compression members are laced together with triangulating web members. So this stable point is traced back to that stable point, which is traced back to that stable point and so forth until the uh, sturdy foundation is reached, which is what allows all four of these members to work together as if they were one unified column of a much larger dimension. This, of course, as we mentioned, is for a crane, but the same concept can be applied to a building. In this case, we have a very small patch of roof being supported on a very tall column, and to give this column breadth, it's been uh, rendered structurally as a trust tube with uh, steel angles welded together. Ironically, it's a very lightweight truss with a very light load but then it got clad in uh, stone uh, sheet so that in the end it looks uh, massive and monolithic even though the internal core of the structure is super lightweight. Um, <clears throat> we have some fairly old examples of trust columns. This is the Eiffel Tower, which is a particularly beautiful and striking example. Um, you'll notice on each of the corners there are four major compression members and they are laced together with truss work and in the case of the Eiffel Tower even the truss work is trussed in the sense that all of these web members which are lacing together the primary members are also trussed tubular uh, members themselves and depending upon the direction of the wind, any one of these members may be called upon to act in compression. So the breadth that they acquire from being trussed tubes allows them to serve that compressive function. So there are very few examples where the truss work is trussed. In other words, there are two levels of trusses. There is the trussing of these larger tubes but then each of those bracing members is also trussed. <clears throat> this is view down closer to the ground. Um, notice the square tubular form. And this is a view from inside the structure looking outward. Um, you see similar things on the Firth of Fourth Bridge. In the case of the Firth of Fourth Bridge, most of these elements are actually primarily tension members, although some of them can go into compression under certain kinds of load shifting, and that's why they're rendered as trust tubes. Uh, they are much more lightly loaded than these primary compression members here, which uh, in the end were rendered as tubes so that the entire wall is working to resist the compressive forces. We can do this on a high-rise building. We can take a whole series of columns, which uh, would be very tall and slender and inherently unstable on their own and lace them together to make a tubular structure. Um, this is a little more subtle form and not so tall, but here we have a compressive member and a compressive member, and then those things are laced together with these web members, and then the web members have been designed to have a slope that correlates with the slope of the stairs, 
So it's a very elegant sort of geometric treatment integrating the bracing system with the stairs. This is another example of a really beautiful structure which has um, cross bracing to stabilize the, the uh, compression portions of the structure. Um, this is not such a beautiful structure, but it, uh, it demonstrates a really important point. Each of these long slender columns has been articulated with truss work. And then in addition to that, because these are pin pin columns in inherently stable against sway at top and bottom, um, the compression members have been curved around so that they come to a point at each end. This is a little more elegant, uh, but similar concept. This is a structure where there are three compressive struts, all of which are fully triangulated. And it turns out that this is actually a self-assembling because this last strut has a sort of elbow or knee joint in it or whatever you want to call it. And it can literally bend in half, which, uh, allows you to start on the ground and then use this last strut to basically erect the structure. In order to do that though, you have to have a huge flexibility. So here we have a hinge line here and a hinge line here that allows the structure a full degree of rotation. All right, so we'd like to understand truss column behavior starting at the component level. And so a few years back, we did some experiments. This is eighth inch diameter uh, styrene welding rod, which is a eighth inch diameter plastic. Um, we looked at various lengths of this and tested it um, under load to determine the failure load for buckling. And we plotted it. So a four inch column was able to resist very little weight just about that much, which would be about five pounds. Um, three inch got much stronger, um, but still weak. Two inch even stronger. And if this had been pure buckling, it would have continued along this curve right here. But at some point, the yielding of the material began to take over. And so instead of being limited by the Euler curve for buckling, it has a lower failure load, and eventually this begins to curve over, indicative of the fact that we're getting to very short columns. But take a look at this. We're still not totally leveled out here, and we have a column that's only half an inch long, and it's an eighth of an inch in diameter. So its length is um, about four times its diameter, and that is, by all reasonable definitions, a really fat column. Um, <clears throat> we laced these together into uh, trust columns with various kinds of bracing, um, but basically the geometric constraint was that if the cross section was dimension E by E, then the spacing of the members or of the joints along the vertical members would be E also. And uh, so we looked at, uh, for example, E equals to three inches in a 24 inch long column. And we also looked at E equal to one inch. So this was, I think, about a 42 inch long column that was about an inch on each side. And it began to exhibit uh, the characteristics of overall buckling and eventually crimped at the center as its failure mode. But what initiated this was overall buckling of the column. On the other hand, when we looked at the shorter columns with a much larger space, spacing between the brace points, we saw a different behavior where the failure was actually a failure, a local failure of the struts on the corners. So instead of overall column failure, we're getting local failure. And by the way, when the slenderness ratio between brace points is the same as the slenderness ratio for the overall column is when the two failure modes would be equally likely to occur. And it also is the point of maximum stress. 
uh, maximum strength of the column. So we can figure out what the proportions ought to be. So we did this. We looked at a one inch column, an inch and a half column, a two inch column, and a three inch column. And we discovered that of those, the strongest was the inch and a half. Um, and then it tapered off as we went to larger uh, dimensions because we got more and more local buckling. Um, for the one inch column, it failed at a lower load because overall buckling was more likely. And when we threw the curves through here and found the intersection, that gave us 1.6 inches as the optimum dimension for this particular geometry. So if we draw that geometry where this dimension is equal to that dimension, for whatever this length L is, the ratio L over E is 26. Um, on the other hand, if we wanted to make a fatter column, we could use an alternate brace pattern. This is called a K bracing. Um, and in this case, this is 2E and that's E. And then the proportions would look more like this than they look like that. So often when we have students designing columns, they'll start to think that a really big column is the solution, but you need to be really careful because when you get a large cross-section, you also start having long members between brace points and vulnerability to local buckling. Now, sometimes you'll end up with a trust column, even in a very high load situation. Um, these are extremely long columns. Uh, underneath the um, City Corp Bank building in New York. In the case of this building, uh, there was a local church here and they decided to let the church keep its property. In other words, not try to buy the property, but just buy the air rights over the property. And then they built them a new church uh, as a sort of part of the bargain. And while they were about it, they opened up all the corners, particularly here's an intersection where there's a good chance to get light, but also there's a lot of um, rich things going on near intersections in New York City. And this was a way of opening up the ground plane to enhance the life in the urban fabric along the street. So they hoisted the building up on these huge columns. And this is another view from the street level. It's an absolutely beautiful building. And this is a view of a diagrammatic view where loads from these corners, which are cantilevered out, are being periodically collected back into a major strut here. So this member should have been rendered in this drawing as a really dark, strong member, which gets down here. And now it splits in two because this very long member would be vulnerable to buckling and it's not very well braced. So that, that column has to be very fat in order to deal with that. And this is what it looks like down at the base. And you'll notice it has exactly that K brace pattern that we were talking about as a way of getting a nice fat trust column at the base of this building. And you'll notice what I said that this column now which is accumulating load from all these floors. You see a, a light member that's getting heavier and heavier as it comes down, and then it's adding its load to this member. So this is a very heavily loaded member, which then splits its load to go into this fat column down below. And that column had to be fat or have greater breadth because it's a very tall uh, column. Uh, sometimes we can use a combination of uh, solid web and, and um, trust webbing. Um, this is not a particularly inspiring architectural example, but it demonstrates that you can get this kind of breadth in a real simple way by just using a wide flange section on, one, on each side and then lacing them together with these bracing members. Very economical, very simple to do and extremely uh, effective structurally. Not too far from here is the Dean Dome at the University of North Carolina. Uh, 
at Chapel Hill. Each of these struts is basically constructed along the same method as this, except those struts are laid with the wide uh, flange elements horizontal um, across the member. So it looks like this. So the bottom cord and the top cord of these truss tubes are 36 inch wide sections. And one of the things that's particularly uh, cool about this is that you can walk up in these tubes to get to television cameras and lights and various things. And it's really smart to design your structure so it accommodates catwalks. Otherwise you have uh, a lot of expensive catwalks all around that uh, are not very substantial and integrating it all in in some logical way makes sense. Um, so you people walk up the sloped surface. It's a little unnerving because you're not always sure that friction is going to be enough to keep you on that slope, but the surface is pretty rough and you can get up there pretty well. This is around the, the compression ring at the top. There's a square compression ring which has these compression struts. So everything in this roof, this element, that element, and that element, they're all working in compression. And they're all these tubular uh, combination of wide flanges and, and angled uh, web members lacing them together. And so what we're looking at is first image we'll look at those two sloped elements and then the next image will be one of these horizontal elements. So here are these two sloped elements on that triangular facet of the roof and then this is one of those horizontal elements around the, the skylight at the top and you'll notice a person over here standing in that truss work so it's a little over six feet deep uh, which accommodates most people walking around without whacking their heads. Uh, this is a classic K-brace configuration in a, in a tower. In this case, it's not a pin-pin column. It's a cantilevered column coming out of the ground. Or in other words, it has a flagpole sort of quality to it. Um, and in this case, uh, these long members are bracing the midpoint of those horizontals. And then these elements are bracing the midpoints of those elements. And when you get high enough in this structure and the structure gets narrower, you go away from the K-brace and just use cross-bracing. That ends our discussion of trust columns, which involves mutually braced compression members laced together with triangulating web members.